same way the, the mud flats then mean, means to me sort of a space that, that's halfway between the city and halfway between the country. But like, this is really a poor excuse for a country scene, actually. Because I mean, it's got, it's got just a hint of what a, a country could provide. Well, we're just living here and somehow it's a magical place. I like it here, I like it here. People that live down here, uh, they're not just a regular bunch of guys. And you know, like they're, they're all. If, if you want to find a bunch of people to try and live with, this is sure an interesting bunch of people because you know the responses and the reactions for the from the individuals to the other individuals, you know, are very sometimes extremely dramatic. You know, sometimes theatrically so, but you know, we accept that as as part of the dance that is our lives. We, you know, we know that the lives we live are. You know, a, a touch colourful and unusual compared to you know the lives of a lot of people. You know, by their choice as much as by our choice. I don't know what you call wildlife. Life, just life. wildlife here with them huge refineries across the way and those speed boots running out there all those piles of logs floating around and dollar and highway on the other side and us living right in with the wildlife I don't know how wild you'd call it it's pretty well trapped it's about doomed we're I guess the uh, tamest part of the wildlife and we'll be about the first part to be wiped out Sculpture, yeah. 
So uh, when I came back in 69, I came out here immediately. Started wandering around and uh, I walked over this way and suddenly I found this cabin. It was the absolute answer to all my desires. That's what we're doing. We're still building this land. Man, we're the wild woolly west, and it's still uh, people's ways of life that have built this country. As a telephone operator when I was 16, I worked for a few years and then it sort of went automatic and I got another job. My, my title there was the Assistant Senior <laughs> Payroll Clerk, Class 2, Group 7. And when you take such good care of where you're living and to think of them just coming in here with bulldozers holds, holds no sense at all. Want some juice? Yeah. Want, hey? some, want some orange juice? No. No, no, I didn't want anything. Everything is good enough. Oh, Michael, he's a man, oh, for sure. Yeah. He's accepted all the newcomers and, and regarded them as, you know, a generation of people whose sense of freedom is much the same as his. He spent his youth riding the rods, and this is where he decided to settle down. It's a fine old man. It'd be a real shame to see him have to be forced to move. Do 
you want to tell us about your dream, Yashi? No. No? I want you, to do a lesson. You want to do a lesson? Oh, what kind of a lesson would you like to do? A grudge lesson. A grudge lesson? Oh, goodness gracious me. Do you know what grudge begins with? What? Grudge begins with a fight. No, yes. You know, I, I get tyke a lot around here, and I get picked up by other housewives who are just curious, and after they talk to me for a while, I've even had two housewives come down here looking for me. But it was just a, it was just an interesting, you know, experience to go through with them. They just, uh, like, they're very curious about, you know, the kind of people that live down here. And I get all kinds of just very sympathetic reactions from uh, other people that have read about the mudflats that I get picked up by. I've never really run into any hostile people. Oh, she's just young, yes? You're big now. You should understand these things. I don't like to explain things to you all the time, and I already explained to you about hitting the other day. It's not right to hit. It's never right to hit. Right Never right to hit. Right to hit. Does it make you feel good? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Makes you feel good to hit somebody? Yes. Yeah. Does it make you feel bad when somebody hits you? Does that mean that if I hit you, you may think it'll be nice? As a scientist, I suppose there are orthodox and unorthodox ways of approaching the problem of evolving consciousness. Yes, five minutes rest period. In this experiment, we are running a subject in transcendental meditation. We're running two groups of subjects, experienced meditators and, at the beginning of the study, naive meditators. We're following them at once monthly intervals over a projected two-year period. The study's been running a year and a half now. And what we're doing is looking at the changes that occur in the organization of their physiological systems as a function of learning to meditate. It's quite clear that subjects undergo quite marked changes in the electrophysiological organization of their brain as a function of learning to meditate. Two or three years ago, Dan and I started to talk about a fantasy fair, about a, a little fair that we could maybe do with a few friends who were craftsmen, and maybe we could attract a couple of thousand people or something. It's always nice to redecorate before a party. I don't think you could do situations like pleasure fairs unless you had a place like the Mud Flats as an energy source for it. It just couldn't be done. Though. It's a complicated ritual we go through, and it's, it produces something beyond the raw materials. It's, you put uh, 150 craftsmen in the field, you've got something more than 150 craftsmen. You've got this, you know, magic is the only word for it. You know, we consider ourselves in the entertainment business now. You know, the pleasure fair is, you know, to us is an ultimate entertainment. Well, not ultimate, but it's the best thing. It's towards a feeling. You know, we're trying to create at the fairs a feeling that a lot of people have just never had the chance to experience. Cut, cut, cut. 
as I see the pleasure fair, it's one of the only realistic methods of getting enough energy together to support our lifestyle that we have right now. It's a commercial production. We're involved in making money. May we summarize our presentation. In the face of federal government support of hostels, communes, and communities in British Columbia, the District of North Vancouver is in the process of destroying a community that is self-sustaining enough not to ask for government support. It is called the Maplewood Mudflats. On August the 1st, 1971, Bulldozers from the District of North Vancouver are scheduled to level its homes. Mr. Mayor, we understand the bulldozers are going to come in and level the homes. Could you give us the city's point of view on this? Yes. Um, these uh, people, who uh, they call themselves squatters, so I don't, it's not my word, um, were warned on May the 28th that the way in which they're living uh, just uh, had no part of an urban uh, municipality. We contribute much to the outside community, yet ask little of it. We harm no one. We live here in peace. We ask merely to be allowed to continue living here in peace. We respect our neighbors within our community. We ask you our neighbors to respect us as your neighbors within the district. We don't believe that uh, squatters living on mud flats uh, just quite fits in with, uh, as I said, an urban municipality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Whose house are we standing on now, Paul? This used to belong to the Dredger family. Uh, one of our people, John, moved into it. He was awakened this morning with the bulldozer up against his house, shaking the house down. your name? Pete. Pete? Pete. Hi, Pete. <laughs> what do you think about this scene going on? I don't know. You know what what is it? your part of it? I'm not involved. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we've been you? asked to do the job, we do the job. Uh -huh. Who asked you to do the job? Well, municipality. We work for them. Uh -huh. Why did you say yes? Well, we work for them. I can say no. Why can't you say no? Don't you dump everything into the bay, because now there's a lot of broken glass. Your cleaners can't even clean that stuff up, you know? Disgusting, man. It's really disgusting. It's really about the poorest example of any human act I've ever seen, man, around here. I mean, it's poor. Really poor. North Vancouver, man. I don't know about, about you guys. Can't you, can't you see what is here? I can see what's here, but I know what I do. I look after Red. You're moving out? You look You're after right. Red. Right, man. That's really sad, isn't it? Yeah. That Red only wants to look after Red. Oh, Surely you're that's do? not... You're doing your job? Is that what you're going to do? Man, look it. You don't know what? You're going to cover that with cement, man? It's part of your job. That's my home, man. That's where I belong. I belong in this area. I've lived here all my life. You're going to do that to my house? I'm not doing it. You are so mad! You can't put the notice on my door! The first guy here was you. You're doing it, man. You're doing it. You're doing it. You and you. And him and him. It's you guys. You're doing your damn job. Good thing you don't know what you're doing. Man, it's not just us, it's nature that you're going to wipe you out here. Every time you come around, I think I got through to you. You went around sort of, hmm, well, you didn't really know what you were doing. You had a confrontation with a bulldozer operator this morning. What happened? Yes, we enacted this little ritual. Uh, the bulldozer operator, I'm sure, really didn't want to do it, uh, but he had this job. Uh, so he got at the bulldozer and started her up, 
next to, towards the house, I stood in front of the bulldozer and leaned on it a little bit, and he stopped the bulldozer and got down from him and said, I don't want to kill anybody, which is absolutely true. I had no intention of moving, of course, but he had no intention of running me down. We've got to get together. Now, if you say no, the next bulldozer man will say no, too. And soon, they're pretty soon, they're going to have to go ahead and spend $20,000 to buy a bulldozer themselves. Yeah, but and <laughs> if the man who sells the bulldozer says no, then where are they going to do it? How are oh, they going to do it? Somebody's going to do, you know, no, you, if, know if, you yeah. can stop progress. If you are the first person team who says no, then the next person will say, my God, that man's a brave man. you got to be in the other guy's shoe. you got to remember, you got to, you know. My name is Doug Welsh. I'm the, the acting manager for the district. What's going to happen today? Uh, we've decided to pull out today. Why? Because we we're afraid that somebody might get hurt.